Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon or whatever time zone you're in around the world. And indeed, if you're uh, watching this on recording after the event. Uh, my name is Derek Ray Hill, and it is my honor to be the Director of International Strategy at the Charities Aid Foundation. Today, we'll spend about an hour discussing giving to Ukraine. And the context for this discussion is really to provide you with some powerful examples of work that is being delivered locally that can be supported directly. At the Charities Aid Foundation, the reason why we're hosting this event is because we facilitate donations around the world. We have operations in the United Kingdom, which is our headquarters, if you will, and allied operations in America, in CAF America, and Canada, in CAF Canada. And we help donors give domestically and around the world to charities based in about 135 different countries last year. And the total of those, those donations was in the region of 876 million pounds. So we care a lot about helping people give directly to a charity based outside their borders. And today we're reminded of the overwhelming need in Ukraine and around Ukraine. We'll be joined by panelists from the region. Uh, first off, our longstanding partner uh, from Bacaz in Bulgaria, Alitsa Verakova. Uh, also, we're delighted to have uh, Lubia Vrenchuk from the Zagori Foundation join us. She is actually joining us from our offices in London. Uh, Kadja Protekta Samoyonskic and Paulina Kamek. So today we'll cover a brief snapshot of the situation in Ukraine a year and a bit on. Uh, supporting Ukraine and its refugees. The situation in Ukraine, through the perspective of an organization working there very actively right now, the Zagori Foundation. The situation in Poland. The situation in Bulgaria. Then we'll have some time for your questions and uh, we'll summarize and wrap up afterwards. Once again, thank you for joining us. If you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, in the meantime, we will start off with a poll. Are you more inclined to support big international NGOs in times of crisis, or do you seek out smaller on the ground organizations to support? I can see the poll box has just come up. Please give us your answers. So if we look at war in Ukraine and its impact, we see a situation that is uh, truly horrific uh, by any calculation or estimation. 5.9 million internally displaced in Ukraine. Some would say that's even a conservative estimate. Approximately 8 million refugees in neighboring countries. 17.6 million humans in need of humanitarian assistance, at least. And places bordering Ukraine uh, and, and near regions are home to so many of the refugees and displaced people, an estimated 60% in Poland. The UN Refugee Agency, as one example, saw a $700 million US funding gap in the first year of the war in Ukraine, putting great strain on operations and the ability to deliver the vital assistance that is required. We are proud for the small part that the Charity State Foundation has played in helping donors help. We have proudly supported uh, the DEC appeal. Uh, CAF America has uh, created the Ukraine Corporate Aid Fund. We're adding value in a number of different ways by helping people give locally and supporting organizations in neighboring countries.
So now I'm uh, pleased to introduce our uh, first panelist, Lubyov Renchak from the Zagori Foundation. Yes, hello everyone from whatever you are. Uh, my name is Lubov Renchuk, and I understand how difficult in pronunciation it might be. I'm the deputy director at Zagori Foundation, which is a Ukrainian uh, foundation that is aimed at building the culture of giving in Ukraine. And trying to do this, we are really into data. So um, everything I will be talking about today will be based on actual information that we gathered from different sources. And the first one um, question that we've been asking, did people see the change in charitable giving after the war broke out? And the majority of people, it's like almost 80% told us that they see that it was increased in this or that way. And I want to emphasize this um, first slide I'm talking about because before the war, this level of uh, how do you, how, how would you see how charity is seen and is it spread or not? People were mostly answering no. And as for now, it's changing. But it's not that uh, promising because if, if we can see, less than um, 1% of humanitarian contribution were directly transferred to national NGOs. And even though 70% of those one who are presented at this webinar told us that they give directly to locals, it's not how it works in the overall perspective. This one less, less than 1% and the number is really just, um, like a smash in the face because no, uh, local nonprofits were the first to answer while big international organizations were doing and are continue to do a lot. It takes time for them to cooperate, to start their programs and so on. But Ukrainians started re response immediately. But uh, we can see that it influenced influenced them a lot. So only 26% of people did not see the um, any kind of signs of professional burnout during the last year of work. We've uh, asked more than 600 organizations. And from what we can assume, it's something really deeply depressing. But what does it mean do you, according to the international giving and to localization of, of resources? Let's go to that part. So even though people continue to tell that it's mostly about their individual characteristics that influence, are they mostly um, about to be affected by burnout? But everyone, uh, we see the tendency that organizational factors influence burnout on people, just uh, smashing them uh, face by face. Uh, firstly, it's about work conditions. Uh, we can we can all talk a lot about how much is it important to have to be the part of um, helping others, and this is the main factor that makes people go work into the uh, into that sphere. But when it comes to routine life, it requires a lot of resources to support your family, to support yourself, and the level of income is small according to the time that you spent on work. And also it was more difficult to operate while you're working online and still trying to consultate people to provide any kind of information they require and so on. And then it comes to the management quality because uh, if you don't see the potential growth of you as a person, it, uh, gives you a lot of instability in your work and it uh, it doesn't seem that you will be able to be satisfied with the work you do and that it comes to the next point well uh, being under stress 
press means that you can start you, you can become a toxic person to your colleagues and that is something that we would like to avoid but of course we cannot do it without resources uh, we can see that people this is one of the quotes that we had during the research that uh, senior manager management often doesn't take into account your ideas. They don't hear you out because they, they are too busy trying to get to the point where the work is done. And that is what, what's important. But we do not need to forget that uh, another thing to, um, to work with is your colleagues is uh, what, well, human resources are also resources, but firstly, it's human. And I would like <laughs> to say why is it important to support local organization if we have well our strategic idea was that if we have healthy and stable organizations they will have enough resources to provide not only the services but also services to their uh, employees which is which is really um, kind of a big deal as for me and um, internationals providing support they can help be more sustainable they can increase their level of capacity and it will promote accountability and transparency into everyday work because this is something what internationals expect from the local partner partners to be and we would like to be more um meet those criteria another thing is that <clears throat> we uh, from time to time, we were the part of the local advocacy meetings or some of the big events, and that was one of the situation when um, um, represented representative from the local organization told that you invited us only on the final stage of making a decision, it, and you were talking in English all the time. We do not know English. We cannot uh, give any advice from what we know and from what we have. You do not listen to us. And at that point, everyone was trying like, no, we will invite you in the future. We will change it and so on. And, and they did at some point because there was, were live translations after that uh, and so on. But it also means that um, from time to time, you can't even know about all the groups, coordinations that are happening because you're not in the context. And when the internationals come to Ukraine, they are um, uh, gathering together because they know each other and the local ones don't. It's something that we need to remember. But of course, there are, there are challenges and barriers that keeps up from that point when we want to um, get when everyone is involved and there is distrust and giving because lack of information, as I mentioned, language barriers, distrust and difficulties with validation of organization that worth trusting or not. The positive uh, the positive impact of resource localization is something that we saw from our own experience. During the war, we helped nearly 15 organizations just matching them with uh, different donors. And uh, we, with the um, support of our international partners, um, organized grant um, deals with up to 50 other organizations uh, adding to this 15. What does it mean? We, we had the um, privilege to be the part of international community as well as having our own network in Ukraine. And it's helped us to organize this successful cooperation on one project uh, to another donor and it, it was a match at the end but on the way to it match there were a lot of um, difficulties and challenges uh, however whenever someone starts to have this cooperation and they are satisfied with the work 
the, that everyone did. It can lead to long-term sustainable funding and it'll, it will help local organizations to focus more on strategy rather than fighting for the everyday survival. Also, uh, I believe that uh, autonomy and inclusion of local organization in the process of programming and decision making, such as during advocacy campaigns, is what we are really into to achieve. And um, I would rather uh, we have several examples of organizations that are not really good at communicating themselves and their activities and their programs, but they are really good at what they are doing. This is just uh, another week. Uh, it happened with the, the study tours that we provide. And that was this organization that we were, we have our doubts because they didn't answer on time. They didn't respond clearly what they are doing and why. But when organizations came, came to visit them, they had really beautiful center where they help people, uh, IDPs, and they help to uh, relocate them. They help to uh, start new life on a new place. And this is something that is done, but they just can not present it. And what about talking presented it in English. So what I believe about localization needs to be done is to hear the needs on the ground and finding the way to, uh, to know is this organization eligible or not. And it's not only about uh, what you can get from the direct communication, but uh, it's about collecting up-to-date information on the everyday basis. Thanks. Hi, so now we're moving on to our, our next speakers. Thank you so much, Lubyov. Uh, Kaya and Paulina, I'll let you take us uh, from here. Thank you. Yes, Derek. Hi, all. I'm Kaya, and with me is Paulina, as Derek said, from the Academy Hello. for the Development of Philanthropy in Poland. And we are one of the oldest and biggest uh, philanthropic organizations in Poland, and also in mainly grant making organizations. And as, as soon as the war started, we took action. We know we knew that operating in Poland, uh, being the largest humanitarian hub, we had to act. And as mentioned, as a grant making organization, we wanted to support as many uh, local organizations that were um, closest to refugees as possible. And luckily, uh, with this thinking, we were supported with our two biggest donors, with Charles Stewart Moon Foundation and Polish American Freedom Foundation. Um, and going into the details, uh, we had prepared a special grant round under our uh, program, European program, that uh, we wanted to support Ukrainian refugees. And we awarded for now 26 grants, 26 grants for amount of uh, 450,000 American dollars. And we granted those, uh, those, 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 we given those grants to, to countries like Slovakia, Romania, Germany, Latvia, Bulgaria, uh, UK, Italy, and uh, mostly to, to, to Poland. Uh, also, uh, we have placed a great emphasis on supporting our homegrown organizations through one of our biggest programs, Act Locally, and that is helping local organizations from uh, localities up to 50,000 residents. And also within this program, we have distributed, as you can see, almost 300,000 American dollars. Um, what's more, within Transnational Giving Europe, we also received some funding from donors. For now, it's almost 50,000 American dollars that we have distributed through our ACT locally centers. So we believe that we, we, we have given uh, a lot for now, and we know that we will be still supporting uh, our local Polish local organizations and also European local organizations, community foundations that want to support refugees still. Uh, also, we have something in the academy called Charity Stars. And uh, so last year we have uh, included a special category for the stars, celebrities that were engaging 
uh, for, for, for Ukrainian refugees being here in Poland that were taking part in very different activities like in-kind collections, like helping preparing hot meals, uh, coordinating transport from the borders to, to the special points for refugees. Uh, so also, you know, as, 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 um, uh, as most Poles, a lot of celebrities also took part in our activities. And uh, also we had a prepared a special report about corporate volunteering for Ukraine that Paulina will tell you a few more words about right now. Uh, yes, actually, because the Academy also uh, runs some projects that are connected to the to business, to companies involved in uh, CSR and uh, are involved in this uh, uh, area, are responsible, are, are engaged uh, socially, yes, uh, in the activities. Actually, we, uh, we run a kind of research survey uh, regarding the employee volunteering for Ukraine. Uh, employee volunteering that was dedicated to help uh, Ukrainian refugees, as well as generally organize some help for Ukraine uh, in the country. So uh, just briefly about the report, uh, we actually uh, in, uh, invited and 31 companies uh, took part in the survey, in the study. Uh, we had the online survey and also some interviews with selected uh, companies and some NGOs that are involved uh, in this uh, help for, for Ukraine and for refugees from Ukraine here in Poland. Uh, mainly there were large companies, so they also uh, operate locally and the employees uh, from the local offices were, were, were uh, quite involved in this, uh, in this help. Uh, so, uh, he, uh, what's in interesting, before the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, only nine companies from this, this group of 31 companies uh, were involved in any kind of help uh, for refugees. Uh, from, of course, various countries at that time. Uh, but the, after the outbreak, uh, all the companies uh, that, that took part in the study, uh, they were involved uh, to help uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, of course, uh, regarding, we also wanted to, to check in the study uh, how far it influenced the regular employees, uh, uh, the regular uh, employee volunteering programs. But it was obvious that it actually, in main, in in in, in a great part of companies, uh, they uh, actually uh, dominated uh, the volunteering uh, programs. Uh, so uh, it also uh, the situation increased the involvement on so far employees uh, vo volunteers from the company. It also uh, increased the the number of uh, of people uh, of companies that were involved in volunteering. Uh, obviously, uh, they also were giving much more time for this uh, to 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 deliver this help. Um, after six months, because the study was conducted on uh, summer 2022, so after six months of, from the beginning of war, uh, this uh, involvement a little bit uh, decreased. Also, the involvement of the companies, the fin financial involvement of the companies also a little bit uh, decreased because actually the companies has given all the resources they, they can just uh, direct to this uh, to these issues as, as well um, uh, the 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 the, ample, the volunteering was uh, a little bit uh, well a little bit decreased uh, uh, that time uh, but the most uh, but uh, the, one great conclusion from the regarding the local context context from this uh, survey was that generally the, the position of the NGOs in Poland, of the uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, strengthen, uh, strength, uh, was strengthened a lot during this time. I mean, even the companies 
they they wanted to give money to local organizations because they believe that those are the organizations that actually know the needs that actually can 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 give real help to the refugees uh, and uh, so the the position of local organizations was 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 strengthened really a lot uh, during that time and the trust also and well and everything and business uh, uh, in Poland, some kind because uh, of, of course in Poland uh, there are some you know national and very big uh, NGOs and uh, but uh, this this experience from uh, helping uh, Ukrainian refugees also opened the the business to uh, local small organizations as the one who are worth to trust and to also to give uh, the money uh, for actions. So this is uh, about the study. Uh, yes, thank you. And about uh, the project that already Kaya mentioned about global challenges, local solutions and the grants that were given to community foundations, uh, because they are the recipients of, of, of the grants in this program. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, we uh, we organized two grant rounds and actually the first grant round mainly uh, the projects were defaulted uh, devoted to, and they uh, they captured the very basic needs because it was at the beginning uh, yes the situation but uh, after the first round we uh, organized a webinar with uh, with the grantees and actually, uh, we already knew that we will be able to organize the second grant round. And actually, we were talking about the, the current needs and also the future needs that the, these community foundations uh, can predict uh, for the actually right now, uh, this month, uh, these months that are right now. So, uh, of course, this long uh, term and systemic support uh, was needed for uh, Ukrainian refugees. And actually, um, just to give the examples from the from the grants, from the programs that are uh, right now performed under the Global Challenges Local Solutions uh, program. Uh, of course, uh, there were some uh, activities supporting local communities accepting refugees it mainly uh, the the issue was to integrate uh, these communities the local communities with uh, with the communities of refugees with refugees uh, and uh, under those projects a lot of meetings were organized a lot of uh, events that uh, were devoted to exchange uh, cultural uh, some habits and also customs and i don't know cooking together uh, everything that uh, brings the that builds this this strange and understanding for one each other uh, and uh, for instance for instance, uh, Fagarash Community Foundations from Romania, they were building a kind of co-working space and they were building in the together with uh, Romanian and Ukrainian uh, refugees. Uh, also, of course, all the activities that were aimed and uh, adap all adaptation activities. So people uh, from Ukraine, ref Ukrainian refugees, they needed some legal help in uh, I don't know, taking care of some formalities, insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, uh, very important is uh, educational uh, uh, aspect. Uh, and uh, in Poland, for example, and also in other countries, but uh, what you could see is the children of uh, that that came from Ukraine. They immediately found their places in Polish schools. And they just directly, almost from the first day, they were sent to Polish schools. And uh, of course, their language skills, as in children, they are just amazing. So they, after a few months, they already spoke perfect Polish. 
So, uh, and also being with uh, their, uh, with children of the same age uh, and mix this, uh, uh, this uh, groups were very important. For adult uh, Ukrainians, of course, uh, also uh, language, uh, language uh, lessons were organized. Uh, it, and this is in uh, in many countries. Uh, in one of the, our projects in Italy, uh, that uh, community foundations also took care of uh, of uh, refugees from Ukraine. Their whole whole project was dedicated to uh, to uh, Italian language. Uh, and also, uh, this is uh, something uh, what Lyubov was talking about, uh, the assistance for volunteers that also that all volunteers actually and uh, in the community foundations, they uh, they faced uh, this kind of burnout and taking care of them is also something which is uh, important in the projects. Uh, well, and the just to short because I think I, I'm talking too much. So uh, also also all kind of integrated activities like summer camps for children from Ukraine were organized during the summertime. Um, and also, uh, yeah. I think that all our all the projects are described on our website, uh, local solutions. Uh, yeah, it will be on the on the next slide. Okay. Yes. Yes. So if you are interested in uh, reading more about all those projects to to treat those good practices, just uh, go to our website localsolutions.org. Um, and just to uh, sum up what you are talking about, we would like to to um, show you two projects in details. Uh, one of our favorites ones, these are two from, from Poland. The first one is from Żywiec, from the um, uh, Żywiecki Community Foundation. And they organized, and they are still, um, still organizing those two projects, Rock for Ukraine and Wall Therapy. And Rock for Ukraine is a music therapy program uh, for kids to uh, assist themselves uh, and to help them uh, in uh, physically and uh, that they are just singing together they are spending time together there is a song written by a songwriter brian allen and it already spread i need to look at my notes um but it already it's in uh i got I, I lost it somewhere, but it's spread all over the Europe and uh, it really engages a lot of children. And the second one is wool therapy. It's uh, rather for adults and it uses the therapeutic benefits of working with wool. Uh, and they also uh, received a lot of donations for those projects and the women together with men and also some children, they are knitting together, crocheting, felting. Uh, and they are also selling those uh, products and receiving, thanks to those works, money for other activities. And the last one is that Paulina will tell you about is from Raciborski Fundusz Lokal. Yes, Raciborski is a town on the uh, south uh, e west uh, uh, border, actually, of Poland. And actually, they received uh, over uh, 1,300 refugees, among them uh, over 600 children. Uh, so they had a project named Ratibusha Re Re Region Open to Ukrainian Refugees, and they actually undertook all the activities uh, activities uh, that helped them uh, to, to find a place to live, to stay, uh, of course, purchase of necessary things, clothes, uh, equipment, medicines, hygienic products, uh, etc. But also uh, psychological help, uh, they deliver psychological help, um, and also language courses. Um, they also organized uh, they also organized the holidays for Ukrainian children, and uh, almost 50 children took, took part in this uh, holidays at the seaside. Uh, and actually, uh, for the end of our presentation, we have a quite moving uh, movie film that uh, was uh, registered during this uh, this camp, this holiday camp.
It's called Dreams of Ukrainian Children. Uh, nazywam się Janek. Nazywam się Polina. Skąd jesteście? Uh, no jest, ja jestem z Melitopola. Jestem z Nikopola. Amina. Marta. Skąd jesteście? Z Czerkas. Z Kijowa. O co chodzicie? Żeby wojna skończyła się. Tak samo. I jeszcze wrócić do domu. O czym marzysz? Może o armii i chcę iść do armii w Ukrainę i walczyć za Ukrainę, żeby ci um, rosyjskie ludzie nas nie obrażali. Mam na imię Robert. Z Ukrainy, z miasta Iwana Frankiewski. No, podoba mi się w Polsce, czuję się dobrze, dobrze przyjęli, mam dużo przyjacielów. No, podoba mi się, ale z Ukrainy trochę tańsko. No. Jestem z Kremieńczuk. O czym marzysz? Marzę pobywać się w Ameryce i polepszyć swój angielski. Nazywam się Jarek. Z jakiego miasta? Z Chmielnicka. O czym marzysz? Marzę o końcu wojny na Ukrainie. Kira. Jesteś z Ukrainy. Z jakiego miasta? Z Mariupol. O czym marzysz? Żeby na Ukrainie już nie było wojny i, Ukra i Rosja już poszła do siebie. Mam na imię Oleg. Z jakiego miasta jesteś? Z miasta Dwu. Jak się czujesz sobie w Polsce? Jest dobrze, mam kolegów. Sława Ukrainie! Thank you so much for that presentation and uh, for all of your moving examples of the work you've been doing, uh, Kaya and Paulina. I'm sure we'll have some questions about that. There are some in the chat as well on, on various topics. Uh, but before we get to questions, uh, I'm delighted to introduce CAF's first ever international partner uh, from uh, Bacaz in Bulgaria, Alitsa Berakova. Hi, thank you, Derek. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm a little bit humbled to, to speak after uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and Poland, who obviously uh, got the most of um, of this critical uh, situation, and all these people who went to to Poland fleeing from uh, uh, from war. Uh, Bulgaria as well welcomed, although we are not a neighboring country, but we have a long-lasting uh, relations with Ukrainian people. So. We did um, got a millennium and 100 Ukrainian refugees who came to, to Bulgaria. There was a certain point uh, uh, in early uh, summer when there were tens, uh, even tens of buses arriving every hour in, on the Romanian border at the Black Sea. And um, all these, these people were primarily, of course, uh, women and children. So. Uh, Bulgaria has to welcome uh, them and uh, um, um, take care of their immediate immediate needs at that at that point. <laughs> um, uh, well, the first so now uh, there are only fifty thousand people uh, remaining, although it's uh, the figure is moving on. Um, we believe that these people are now here, most of them to stay, and uh, really nearly eighty ninety percent of their women and children. Go to the next one, next slide, please. So there, first, as I as I told you, uh, there were uh, organizations in Bulgaria who had connections with Ukraine. We do know Ukrainian organizations um, because there is an ethnic group of Bulgarians living in the southern part of Ukraine. Uh, but suddenly, organizations like Mother Ukraine in Bulgaria or the Association of Bulgarian uh, Bessarabs of Bulgarians. Uh, these folk dancing um, cultural exchange organizations needed to become aid organizations and to to meet the 
uh, the evacuation, housing, food, uh, and other humanitarian uh, needs of uh, a thousand, uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians to Bulgaria. The NGOs, the local organizations, were the first to respond. And actually, all the good things that happened to the Bulgarian, to the Ukrainian refugees in Bulgaria, was uh, due to the efforts of uh, uh, of our colleagues, uh, who, because a support organization supported with our donor mechanism and by calling to the donor community in Bulgaria to to support um, uh, the organizations. Uh, BG40 Way was a, a business-led initiative which because hosted and supported a lot. And it started with um, uh, doing a, a website, uh, helping the evacuation of uh, Ukrainians. So that was time when uh, a, a Bulgarian would just take a car and go to the border of uh, Ukraine in Romania and just uh, see if they can um, can take uh, a family or two or three and uh, take it back to to freedom to to safe place in in Bulgaria and that was a time of huge huge response more than thirty thousand Bulgarians opened their their homes and offered some kind of assistance. My friend uh, Jenny she still hosts uh, a Ukrainian woman and her daughter who now studies in a a fashion art school. And uh, they started a, a small business uh, um, uh, selling clothing to to Bulgarian women. But next uh, next slide uh, with the with the time uh, going on, the needs of uh, other refugees in in uh, Bulgaria, of course, changed, and they now needed more. Uh, uh, although humanitarian aid uh, needs uh, remain uh, similar, but there were issues about. Um, uh, people with health, uh, health uh, uh, situations, especially elderly or uh, children with um, disabilities. So again, NGOs were able to, to collect funds and, and do, uh, do help include um, like um, uh, ELA or the four hour children organizations, we supported them uh, to include uh, Ukrainian children with disabilities within their support services. And offer some safe place for for their uh, for their families and their mothers. Uh, to get education, my colleagues talked about that. Bulgarian language lessons for people who want to do that um, are in place, and that's an ongoing need. Uh, it's good that beside um, this cultural relationship, Bulgaria also had relationships with uh, Ukrainian people because uh, we had immigrants from Ukraine before the before the war. We had a strong Ukrainian-led IT community who offered jobs and uh, employment and uh, support to uh, to their to their country people who um, came to Bulgaria. So that was um, <coughs> that was a good thing for them as well. Um, uh, the, the, uh, I need to say that it was all done through uh, local donations, a lot of volunteerism while the Bulgarian government uh, uh, lagged behind. Uh, so it was only probably 10 months uh, after the, the beginning of the support when um, there was some uh, uh, government of, governmentally funded and uh, UN funded program which was implemented in Bulgaria. And next slide. Um, Bulgarians were not only active to support uh, refugees who came to Bulgaria, but we were were and are active in supporting Ukraine direct. As I say, nearly everyone has someone he knows in Ukraine, an organization, a school, a theater. So um, um, with uh, Mother Ukraine, the local organization, for example, we were able to send a lot of medical supplies, equipment, small equipment like the one on the, on the picture and um, a lot of um, uh, medical supplies to, Ukraine and with the a winter in the winter uh, we sent um, boots to the Ukrainian army and blankets and heaters um, especially a famous a very popular became in Bulgaria the, the fundraising initiative for electricity generators uh, by a local publisher Manol Pekov who were able to uh, raise well I think the Bulgarian government sent three gener generators to Ukraine to Ukraine uh, he himself and his friends uh, uh, were able to send uh, uh, 200 uh, generators directly to, again, schools, hospitals. Some of these generators were really big, 
So we are help. Uh, uh, we are able to help uh, directly people in Ukraine as well. So the results. My next slide. Uh, especially because organization has uh, our support counts to 3 million Bulgarian uh, level, about a million and a half euros. So this goes to about um, 23 organizations uh, uh, who, who got grants or another seven uh, who uh, fundraised uh, on our fundraising instruments and uh, relates, related to donors. Uh, there was a variety of uh, 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 grants um, uh, aiming um, different uh, needs of uh, Ukrainians in Bulgaria, starting from uh, basic uh, aid, uh, but also going to all the way to supporting food for cats uh, or dogs uh, uh, the Ukrainian refugees brought with them. Um, <coughs> um, only within our project, we were able to provide 19,000 people with some kind of support and on a uh, continuous basis, not one off. And next slide, but the thing is that these people are, are here, and although many of them dream to leave, to go back, uh, some some families like um, uh, Anna, who I know, who came without uh, with her three kids because her husband was killed, uh, she now claims uh, Bulgaria is her new home. She started a job as an accountant in a, in a company thanks to the assistance of one of the NGOs uh, who supported her. So um, we are really um, looking uh, with, I, I share the same observation that um, uh, the donor community within Bulgaria got exhausted. Uh, in between, we had a regional local flood. We had the Turkish and uh, Syrian earthquake nearby, near to uh, our other uh, border. So um, uh, the, the local donors are exhausted while um, <coughs> while the, the Ukrainians living in Bulgaria do, do continue to need basic support. At the moment, we raise funds for Bulgarian language training lessons. Uh, we get uh, young uh, people into uh, driving lessons so that they are compatible, com they can join employment, uh, which requires um, um, driving uh, license. And um, we, we need to support this real integration. For a while, Ukrainian refugees lived in seaside resorts at the Black Sea or lived in New mountain resorts. That was not good for integration. And although when it's good for elderly, it's not good for the uh, youngsters and, uh, uh, and families. Uh, so now more and more uh, local NGOs are offering uh, programs which are joined for Bulgarian uh, youngsters and Ukrainian uh, youngsters. And um, uh, we also plan with um, uh, some uh, organizations active in the entrepreneurship uh, domain to launch an entrepreneurship support program for Ukrainians because these are uh, active, uh, uh, working really hard women who we welcome in Bulgaria. And some of them have their business ideas of their own. So this is the thing we look forward uh, for, uh, to be able to support them in their startup plus in their self-employment activities. And um, uh, real integration, um, we want to, to, to welcome uh, these um, people who are really very much like Bulgarians, that's why Bulgarians were so supportive and so um, uh, ready to welcome uh, the people at, at their homes. They are so much like us and um, uh, many of my colleagues uh, from the local NGOs, we do want to continue to help them become a part of the Bulgarian community. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alitsa, uh, for that presentation. And, you know, I think the theme exhausted. <laughs> runs throughout this, exhausted on the ground, delivering the work, donor fatigue, uh, and sadly, other international crises coming along. And uh, so I, I think we all hope that today's webinar really emphasizes the extreme need that continues around war in Ukraine uh, to help the various people that have been displaced and their lives affected in so many very difficult and horrifying ways. Um, I will uh, conclude by asking the panelists 
what one message they would like donors and people advising donors that are on this webinar to take away from their presentations today. Uh, but before uh, I do that, there are a couple of questions that have come through uh, the chat. And I'm gonna ask one uh, from Vladimir, who, by the way, uh, has been very eloquent in the chat. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Unfortunately, I don't think we can take all of his suggestions in the chat, but I do want to pick up on a theme that he highlights, which is the degree to which there is inter-organizational cooperation in your area and how you would rate that cooperation. Are people genuinely working together and collaborating or are people a little bit siloed? I guess would be the two. If we use his rating scale, silo would be one or two and genuine thorough cooperation would be eight and above. Uh, I hope you don't mind that characterization uh, of Vladimir. So uh, Lubyov, how, how would you rate cooperation? How would I rate cooperation? Well, you know, it's always, um... A difficult question to answer but i would say that and i missed some of the questions from vadim in the chat because there were so many of them and uh, i would say that cooperation and um i i believe that vadim also mentioned about something interactions inter projects cooperations and <clears throat> i think that it always depends on the idea of uh, what different organization would like to achieve together. As for if we need to evaluate the cooperation that we had in 2022, I would say that we jumped over the head because it was always a lot of work to do like on a routine um, part of life but also about to uh, trying to get new contacts and uh, get into the point with all the localization strategy that we had. Uh, as for the uh, cooperation in one country, it's always a bit challenging and I don't know why, but we were trying to organize coordination, uh, coordinating groups. We wanted to um, get people together to just talk and to realize who is doing what. And uh, I would say, firstly, it worked. We got a lot of insights and ideas, but always it's about community. If you want cooperation existing, you need to put a lot of effort in it. And it's always about who leads the process and what are the goals of this. Thank you very much. Uh, Kaya and Paulina, would you add anything to that from the Polish perspective? Uh, yes, within our organization regarding Ukraine, we have, as I can say, two uh, different paths. The one is dedicated to supporting European organizations, and the other one is dedicated to supporting Polish organizations, as we know they are the, the most in need. So we cannot say that there is like a tight cooperation between them because they have their dedicated tasks. But yeah, on this specific subject, this specific issue, uh, we have some kind of inter-project cooperation in, in our organization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if you don't mind, Alyssa, I'll go to you first in the wrap up, but not on this question. And I just wanted to, to acknowledge the post of Jean-Pierre Caron, which we won't be able to get, uh, um, get to uh, right now. Uh, but of course, we would encourage everyone to think about organizations they can support locally, if that's the decision they would like to make as a donor. And uh, certainly we would say that those donations, you know, have uh, a different type of impact to other ways that people have donated uh, via transnational organizations and INGOs. Um, so uh, in order to allow a couple of minutes for people to prepare for the next meeting, I'll go to the closing question uh, and to Alitza first. What one message would you like the donors and the people that advise donors on this uh, webinar today to take away? Um, my message is that um, and the civil society organizations in Bulgaria and generally in the Central and Eastern Europe is, has been mature enough and in times of emergency, uh, we are really able to provide a flexible, a, a flexible 
approach to, to the crisis and able to, to, to meet the needs um, uh, in a very efficient manner. We proved, we proved that during COVID and during all the emergency that seems not to go away from our region. And uh, with the Ukrainian refugee uh, situation in, in, in my country, um, local organizations uh, were able to do whatever they do in culture, education, social assistance, to lend these hands to the uh, most people in need. And this is something that the international donor community should know they can count on local organizations. Thank you so much. That's so encouraging. Kaya and Paulina, what one message would you like uh, people to take away? Well, to actually to appreciate local organizations as they are the organization that has a great potential, knowledge, experience, and they really are into local needs and they know the local needs. And uh, this, this whole situation with war has proved this, that, uh, that it is really worth to appreciate the work and to support local organizations. Yeah, and also when we received support from our biggest partners, as I mentioned before, we knew from the beginning where we should direct this support that to our partners, local partners, community foundations that do their best and they are trustful. And yeah, that's thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and it's been inspiring to hear about all that work. Thank you. Uh, Lubyov. mind and then I lost it so I will tell another um, we we did one of the research about needs and um, internal insights from the experts of NGO sector in May 2022 and it was repeated many many times and this one thought is basically turned to donors uh, try to be flexible. The world is changing really quickly, and especially during the war time, uh, and uh, knowing how much is required to get to the point where the agreement is signed and then the uh, funding is um, sent. We need to be on track, to, uh, on track with the needs. It's not necessary just to follow the grant proposal or application as it was written. We're it will be much more efficient if we uh, go step by step knowing these like agile methods of uh, running projects and programs and it's also important not just to not just to fund projects but or having this more long term uh, relationship wow thank you so much uh so uh it only remains for me to mention to everybody uh, on this webinar that if you do want to give, uh, please do contact uh, your trusted uh, partners in doing so. Uh, I would encourage uh, people in the United Kingdom to look up the Charities Aid Foundation, uh, in America to look up CAF America, and in Canada to look up CAF Canada. But also to a point that Kaya and Paulina made, uh, we are uh, members of Transnational Giving Europe, and Transnational Giving Europe is an organization covering 20 countries within the European Union and, uh, and countries like ours that are in Europe, uh, and it allows donors to give directly from one country to another uh, and, and receive the benefits of doing so in their own country. So if you are located in Europe, we would encourage you uh, to put Transnational Giving Europe into your search engine and you will find uh, your local partner. Thank you to Alitsa, Kaya, Paulina, uh, Lubyov, uh, and uh, two individuals that are not visible, that are colleagues of mine, uh, Rachel uh, Nickel and, and uh, Elisa Hamzik for all the hard work that has gone into today. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're watching this live with us now, or uh, watching it on recording, please have a good day. Thank you for your support.